the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O Lord, who enlightens the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray for us. And St. Thomas More, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pretty sure he's the patron saint of Rome, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. And uh, anyway, so we, today we continue with the uh, talk on the theological virtues. So we started last week with faith, and now hope we cover hope and love. Hopefully, I'll cover hope and love because we've only got about 40 minutes, or not even 40 minutes, about half an hour. But anyway. That's okay. We're well, going to have an abbreviated version. So one of the things I mentioned last week was that the, the theological virtue, we often refer to uh, our life as in uh, with Christ, our life of faith. And we mean faith is in everything to do with him. But in fact, there are three virtues that inform us and that allow us to know God. And we call them theological because they actually are dependent very much upon God, not on nature. And they actually allow us to know him, to taste him, to sense him with a, a real um, contact through, base, through, not basically, through the, his grace. And there's no sort of, although there's a natural basis of faith, nevertheless, there's, it's not the same thing as, say, the virtue of industriousness or the virtue of honesty, whereby practicing honesty, we then prepare the groundwork for you know, the, the infused virtue of, say, um, prudence or, or right judgment. It's not, not just like right judgment is a gift for the, of the Holy Spirit, but the virtue of prudence or, of, um, or by practicing courage in the natural sphere, we actually also prepare the groundwork for the supernatural fortitude of grace. So then to continue, but before I begin on, on the thing of, of hope, the virtue of hope, I want to just mention something about the virtue of faith. So. Faith increases indirectly. Faith, hope, and love increase within us indirectly uh, by God's grace. But there are certain things that we can do to make it increase all the more, and then obviously certain things that we can do that could decrease it and would decrease it. We've all met people, probably, uh, who have gone from a fervent faith to a very lukewarm faith. Any of you have come across such people? Okay, some of you yes, some of you no. Um, I'd like to say you won't in your life, those of you who haven't, but the sad reality is that's often the case. And you know, we can go backwards and forwards and say, well, did they ever really believe or not? The reality is it's possible. It's possible to lose faith. So it's a treasure and we need to safeguard it. So what helps faith to grow and to increase or prepare the groundwork, even though God is the one who gives the impulse? It's prayer. That's no surprise to anyone. Good spiritual reading. So reading the scriptures, reading the lives of the saints, examples of others who have lived a life of faith. I love reading heroism of, uh, not that I get that much time to read these stories these days, but the heroism of people who've lived a life of faith. And that's why I like the lives of the saints. But I like particularly hearing about their own interior experience of how they cope with various trials, various difficulties, and yet they persevered. And frequently, or not infrequently, it went like this for years. For example, St. Teresa of Avila, we celebrated her feast day on the 16th of October. She's the first woman doctor of the church, the great Spanish Carmelite, who was asked by our Lord to reform the Carmelite order. And the Carmelite order had become sort of at least in Spain, and in many parts of the world, very comfortable, very comfortable. And the Lord wanted her to reform this order and to make it more evangelical, stricter in the observance, and to be able to follow Christ more closely to a penitential way of life. Anyway, the number of obstacles that she came across were enormous, but she kept on persevering. And the Lord gave her many graces, many favors. But at one point, when she was complaining to him, and, and our Lord says to her, you know, 
complaining because, you know, it's so hard and it is really difficult and so forth. And the Lord says to her, Teresa, when have I failed you? And she couldn't say anything because when she had a good look at things in her own life, even though things were difficult, the Lord came good. And then another time, you know, she was complaining. Don't get me wrong. She didn't just complain, right? Uh, but she was complaining. But I love these moments because I complain too. And you probably do at times as well. And the Lord has whatever these or several different responses. And he, she was complaining on this other occasion. And the Lord says to her, uh, Teresa, this is how I treat my friends. She shot straight back at him and said, no wonder you have so few of them, you know. <laughs> well, you know, we look at the campus and so forth. How many are really willing and bold to stand up for Christ? You know, relatively few. Many might believe it, but then in their hearts, but then taking that extra step and going out openly takes courage, takes determination, takes a real act of faith. And so prayer, good spiritual reading, and also keeping association with people who have a living faith. We don't get to heaven or to hell for that matter alone. St. John Bosco's mother, the founder of the Salesians, told him, not once I think, but many times, a priest doesn't go to heaven or hell alone. You take people with you. And so when we get into heaven on our life there, we need to be around people of faith so that when we're feeling strong and they're feeling weak, we can help them. And when we're feeling weak and they're feeling stronger, they can help us. We've got more chance of getting to the end that way. Of course, if we don't pray, if we read the wrong things, if we keep company with the wrong people, then our faith will get cold. Our faith, if it's not practiced, then it will atrophy or atrophy, however you say the word. You know, we often refer to going to Mass on Sunday as the practice of the faith. And it's true that it needs to be, sorry about that, it needs to be, I beg your pardon, just, uh, okay, I think we're still going, good. Uh, the, the faith, we say, we practice it. And we, um, and so it's like a muscle. A muscle that's practiced gets stronger. A muscle that isn't practiced shrinks and gets weaker and eventually will perhaps even non-existent. So faith can increase, faith can decrease. Now faith naturally, once the conviction begins to grow, it leads on to hope. So we begin, so faith means believing in those things that we cannot see, things that are revealed by God, by his own authority. We covered this last week. So now when we are convinced of these things, we begin to hope in them. Because that's naturally what follows on from our convictions. If we are convinced about the truth of something, then we begin to make plans of our lives based on those things. So the virtue of hope becomes something then that is very much founded on faith. The virtue of hope, though, is works in a different way. It has a different kind of purpose for us as human beings. Because the virtue of hope is really the virtue of the, the man or woman on the journey. The homo viato, they would say in the Latin, you know, the human being on the journey, the on the walk. Why? Because it is the virtue that enables us to look to the future with confidence that somehow tomorrow will work out all right. I may not know or have any idea of what's coming. I may even be in the deepest darkness. I may be going through a difficult personal situation. I may be going through, I don't know, financial hardship, uh, a relationship breakdown. I don't know, someone close to me died, whatever it happens to be. But so humanly, all the evidence around me is actually dark. It's saying, mate, tomorrow is going to look pretty grim. The future is going to look pretty grim. And yet the virtue of hope somehow sustains us. You know what? I can't see how tomorrow is going to work out all right. But I hope that it will. 
And that hope actually gives me a conviction that it will somehow turn out. What's that hope coming from? It's coming from faith. It's, and the faith assures me that God is our Father, that God is close to us, that God sustains us even when we cannot feel His presence. And this is typically when we can be tempted to perhaps doubt in God or lack of or lack of trust in or lack trust in Him when we feel His absence. But this is in fact when the purest faith and the purest hope is beginning to operate within us. St. John of the Cross, one of the great teachers of the church, masters really of the spiritual life, he talks about faith. Now I'm not sure if I mentioned this uh, last week, but he talks about the darkness of faith. What does he mean by this? It means that in those moments of our lives where we are most tested, when all the human props, the crutches, are taken from us by God, for our own good, by the way, because he wants us to grow in trust of him, then we actually can't see anything around us that makes sense, that enables us to go on. And yet, a conviction from deep within somehow sustains us and enables us to go on forward with stubbornness to keep walking faithfully day after day after day. And he says at that moment, he calls it the darkness of faith. In other words, everything else is dark. Only faith shines. Only faith is a light. You've all probably seen the Lord of the Rings films. Uh, I'm not sure which episode. The first lot, not the Hobbit ones. The, yeah, the Lord of the Rings. And the I think Frodo meets um, that uh, what's her name? The what's she called? The angel one. The, um, the good the good guys. The the uh, the elves. Thank you. The elves. It's uh, the pointy ears. And uh, anyway, she's the Australian actress, and she gives him the light. And she says, this light will shine when all the others have failed. The light of faith acts like that. And if we are privileged to find ourselves in a moment like that in our life, that may last for weeks or months or perhaps years, then count yourselves fortunate because God is carrying out a purification in your life because he wants to bring you to another level. Don't think. He has abandoned you. That is not what happens. Our Father God is a faithful Father who is with us all the time. And so the, you know, the, the darkness of faith means that. Now, similar, something similar goes on with hope. Because when God wants to deepen our trust in Him, how is trust deepened? It's deepened when it is tested. I know that ugly, filthy word. Testing, you know, we're all about to go into testing and examination. Some of you feel more confident, some of you less so. But the thing is, we don't like to be tested. And we, in fact, even say in the Our Father, the words Jesus himself has given us, you know, lead us not into temptation. And the sense in the original Greek is perazo, which means to test, to tempt, or to attempt. But the sense is, do not put us to the test. Why? Because I might fall might fall. And yet, if I am not tested, I will not know my limits. So it's through testing that I grow. It's through being stretched that I realize what I am able to achieve. Even though it feels uncomfortable, even though we've got to work hard, even though we've got to go to the place where it is uncomfortable to go, but that's how we grow. So if we want a comfortable life, fine. We won't grow, yes. And eventually our hearts will shrink. And we will not only not achieve our full potential, but we will be more and more frustrated. Because God has given us the various talents we have in order to make maximum use of them. To serve Him, to build up the kingdom and to become the greatest human beings that we can be on a natural level and particularly on a supernatural level to grow in holiness. But stretching, as I said, makes us uncomfortable. 
So in fact, God brings us to the point of testing in order to make us grow, to make our trust in him grow. The devil, interestingly, also brings us to the same point, but to cause us to fall. Notice that temptation is like, really, it's one coin. God brings us to the point of temptation to make us rise higher. The devil wants to bring us there to cause us to fall, and then after the fall, to make us descend into discouragement and despair. So the opposite of hope is despair, and it means I cannot look forward to the future with confidence. The future is very grim. So how does God make our hope in him grow? By testing it. He did it for the Israelites in ancient Israel for 40 years. And he's constantly testing them. Firstly with the ten marvels in Egypt. And eventually they began to realize, yeah, our God's pretty powerful. Our God's amazing. But then he takes them out into the wilderness. And remember there was going to be, they get to the promised land about nine or ten months, something like that, after they leave the land of Egypt. But how long does it actually take them to enter into the promised land? Okay, 40 years, exactly, 40 years. So why does it go from 10 months to 40 years? Because the people are not ready. And I don't know about yourselves, but uh, most of you are still very young. But the, exactly, don't worry, they don't know who, uh, who the others are. But uh, the, uh, I'm middle-aged, and, you know, we'd like to think that we grow in trust and in hope very readily, at will, but we can't. We grow at God's will, at God's pace. So the most we can do is to entrust ourselves to Him and to let Him carry us. I draw hope from reading the story of ancient Israel. And the church takes us through it both in the divine office and in the, in the time of Lent and so forth in the liturgical year. Because it took 40 years for the ancient Israelites to learn how to trust God. Will you trust me, God is saying? Will you trust me? I'm providing for you. Manna in the morning and meat in the afternoon. I'm feeding you. And then eventually they get to the end of the 40 years after all that older generation had to die off because they were so faithless. They wouldn't learn the ways of the Lord. But the younger generation did. And they, you know, they realized, yeah, the clothes did not wear out on our backs. God did keep us going. How often we fret and worry and bite our nails if we're into nail biting. Uh, whatever it happens to be, and because we think something is going to come to the end. The world is about to end. And then we get through. Oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. But gosh, the nerves are there. And they're wounding up and fretting and that anxiety. And Jesus has some beautiful things to say about this in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, um, making verses 25 to 34. You know, the, the flowers of the field and the birds of the air and the birds they neither sow, nor the flowers neither sow nor spin, but not even Solomon in all his regalia was clothed like one of these. And the birds of the air, they don't, you know, they don't care. But God feeds them. God feeds them. How much more will he care for you? So we know this in our heads though. But for that to move to the emotional level that we really trust in God, that takes work takes openness on our part, an abandonment of spirit into his hands, and responding to the opportunities that he gives to us. I remember hearing a powerful story uh, about Abraham Lincoln, and it was uh, the night before a major battle that he was going to, that he and his army were going to fight. And one after the other, his generals were coming to him and saying, you know, um, Abraham or whatever, and uh, he said, uh, you seem to be very calm about tomorrow's battle. It's very decisive. And when enough of them had said this to him, he eventually thought, I've got to call them together. So he called all the men together, 
And he said, some of you have said such and such a thing to me. Well, I have to tell you something. Yesterday, I was very, very worried about this battle tomorrow. So I actually spent the entire night in prayer to God. And as the hours wore on, somehow the conviction began to arise within me that the battle will go in our favor. I don't know how, but it will go in our favor. And I felt this conviction coming to me from God. And so now I'm not worried. I'm not worried that I don't know the future. I'm not worried that I can't make sense of how things are going to work out. But somehow things will work out because he's guiding us. Now, I'm not sure what the other army thought, right? But the point is, though, he spent the night in prayer. And we will experience moments like this in our own lives, where we feel, uh, whether it's an exam or some big decision you've got to make in your life, and you can't see things clearly, but you just persevere in prayer. And this is an example that the saints left us. And gradually the conviction begins to change. I remember one time, 20-something years ago, I had a very painful moment in my life, and I was really tested deeply about my trust in God. I'd received a conviction that certain things would happen, but I couldn't see how. And so I had to just abandon myself to Him. And I had to keep asking myself, Mark, do you really believe? Do you trust Him? Or do you just wrap it off and that's it? Because real faith and real hope and real love changes us. It gives us peace. It gives us calm. Now, hope, as I said, can also, just like faith, can be increased and can also decrease. And we decrease in our hope by not praying but not relying on God and seeing His hands playing out in our lives by reading the wrong things, hanging around the wrong people. We need to be around people of hope so that we can also maintain our hope. Because sometimes we will feel weaker. And there's nothing wrong in feeling weaker. It's just part of the natural human experience. But if we're around people who are stronger, then we will be sustained and buoyed up. And sometimes all we need is someone to just listen to us and hear us, to know our struggles, our pains, whatever it happens to be. Some will struggle with emotional, mental illnesses. And these need people need hope. In fact, everybody needs hope. But these people need hope in a particular way. And they have a particularly difficult cross that they have to carry. But Christ wants to come to their rescue as well, and does come to their rescue, but he requires the same abandonment into his arms that he asks from each one of us. Love. And by the way, without hope, people die. People die. People die, firstly, spiritually, emotionally, and then they will die a lot of the people who take their lives, I mean, for, for years, centuries, the church never buried or gave Christian burial to those who committed suicide. Because the understanding was, well, this is a terrible sin, and they are lost for sure. But then the church's thinking developed and came to realize, yes, objectively, it is a grave sin to take one's life sin against the fifth commandment and life belongs to God and cannot be touched by any human hand. But the church came to realize there's also the interior, the subjective dimension of, of, uh, of the person. And we can't commit a sin against faith, against hope, sorry, which is the sin of despair unless internally we are often, we're at that point. And the realization or the, the development in church's thinking came about because a lot of people who take their lives, they're typically psychologically imbalanced, they're in a very unhealthy place internally, 
And frequently, it's beyond their control. So when people take their own lives, whichever way they do it, typically, and I can't obviously speak with the certainty that, that God would know, then they're not in full control of their senses when they take their lives. It's actually about escaping the pain of their own life, of their own situation, rather than because they want to end the goodness of life. So it's about escaping the pain. And so the church now buries them all, buries all people, regardless of how they die, because she recognizes that only God is the judge of someone's heart. Only God knows the inside. And you know, it doesn't mean that a person can't be lost forever by taking his or her own life, but it just means that we cannot jump to conclusions because we only know the outside. God alone knows the heart. And you remember from the talk on the sacrament of penance, reconciliation, that in order to commit a mortal sin, we need the three conditions to be met, defined very clearly in the Council of Trent, a dogmatic council. Full knowledge, great matter of full knowledge and full consent. All those three conditions need to be present in order to commit a great sin or a mortal sin. If one of those is missing or only partially present, then we cannot commit a mortal sin, which means it's either a venial sin or possibly no sin at all. So therefore, there cannot be a, uh, an exclusion of the, uh, an extinguishing of the life of, of Christ. Even though something externally may be very bad, but if the internal conditions are not met, then although the effects can still be the same, you know, the, the any harm, nevertheless, it won't extinguish the life of Christ within me. For example, uh, the arsenic. Arsenic is a, a clear liquid never I've been told this, clear liquid apparently smells like almonds and can be quite sweet tasting. So I'm on a hot summer's day and I somehow mistake a glass of arsenic for cold, cool, refreshing <laughs> drink, you know? So I guzzle it down and thinking it's going to do me great good and 20 minutes later I'm, in, I'm dead, uh, of course having experienced excruciating pains and whatever. And this is a, you know, because it's, regardless of my own thinking, then it doesn't change the nature of arsenic. It's still going to do me harm. And there are some sins, some actions that we call intrinsic evil. They're just so disordered, no matter what I do in my thinking to try and make them seem right, it will never be right. They will still do me harm. But that's the case that I'm talking about, someone who takes their life who is not in a right place, such a person cannot extinguish the life of God. Okay, so quickly, the virtue of love. The virtue of love is, oh, well, I should mention one more thing before we leave hope. The medievalists, sorry, this Morton's been referring to me. The virtue of hope, medievalists or the scholastics used to say, has a particular connection with the memory. Hmm. Does that strike anyone as a puzzling thing? The virtue of hope, which makes us look to the future with confidence, is somehow connected with the memory. The memory connects us with the past. So what is going on? Because this is what's going on. The reason we are able to look forward to the future with confidence, we live in the present. The memory connects us with the past. But God has not given us a faculty, an intellectual faculty, that somehow knows the future. So that's where the virtue of hope comes in. But the reason we're able to look forward to the future with confidence in hope is because we have a memory of God looking after us in our past. So through our own personal encounters with God, helping us, sustaining us, in the past, we know God will come for our rescue. And this is a central lesson that the people of Israel, ancient Israel, had to learn. Did not our father save us from Egypt? Did not our father punish the false gods of Egypt? Did he not show Pharaoh who was boss? Yes, he did. How did he do it? Boom, boom, boom. So they constantly kept telling their story to their children so that they wouldn't forget. 
Why? Because in the forgetfulness, connected with the memory, they lose sight of what God had done for them, you lose sight of what God had done for you, then you don't have hope for God to come to your rescue in the future, so you in, in a, in, uh, then turn to other people for help, and they can't save you. So love, love, the medievalist would say, is connected particularly with the will, with the will. So faith with the intellect, hope with the memory, and love with the will. The will's job is to, once the intellect presents to it what is good, it then chooses it. So it goes after what is good, and it gives itself to something or to someone. Love, as St. John Paul II defines it in his letter to families, is a sincere gift of self. It's the part that we are totally in control of. Do I give myself to someone sincerely or not? I can give myself to someone insincerely, mock them, take them for a ride, deceive them, enter into a deceitful relationship. All these are insincere gifts of ourselves. But real love enables us to make a gift of ourselves to another. Now, we're talking here about charity, but the love of God also is connected very much with the love of another human being. And at five minutes before, could someone just um, let me know, please? Yeah, so we'll, uh, I'm not sure if there's a class coming after us. But the, so it's not disconnected from human love. So let's talk a bit about human love in order to help us understand more deeply the love of God. So we often talk about the virtues, the theological virtues is faith, hope, and love. But the more accurate term is faith, hope, and charity. Because charity is a word we use in spiritual terms exclusively for the love of God. Now I know we use it colloquially as in a charity. The church for government purposes is a charity. St. Vincent de Paul Society is a charity. But they're not talking about theological spiritual terms there, right? It's just common English usage. In the church, in spiritual talk, charity is referring exclusively to the love of God. God gives us that gift to be able to trust, to believe in Him first of all, to hope in Him and to love Him, to give ourselves to Him. What happens though to us as we give ourselves to another human being? Because if we don't know how to love another human being, we can't very well say that we love God. Because St. John in his letter writes, how can you say you love God whom you cannot see, when you cannot even love your neighbor whom you do see? And there's a very valid point because there are many people in the world, and I think in the church too, uh, no, I think, I believe that, <laughs> more than thinking, who say they love God, but their actions show otherwise. Their actions show otherwise. So, what is it when I give myself to someone in love? What begins to happen? I begin to share myself with that person in friendship. And this will happen in any friendship. Uh, you know, a, a friend from school or a friend, a colleague, or a, uh, like a courtship, marriage, whatever. It'll happen there. I begin to actually share myself with that person. That person begins to share themselves with me. The more time I spend with them and sharing them, we talk about things, we share experiences, we discuss issues together, common interests, whatever it happens to be. The more I do that, the more that person actually begins to somehow enter into me. Because we are spiritual creatures. Now, if, it's, if a person is entering into me, somehow I must be a reservoir to hold those, to hold relationships. And I can have several relationships, but there's a limit to how many deep relationships that I can have. And here I'm talking about particularly the deep relationships, the ones that nourish us the most. Those relationships begin to enter into us. And as we know that person, the reservoir is ultimately our memory. So as we come to know and love various things about other people, 
those things stay within us. And then as we call them to mind at will from our memory, they actually bring us closer to the person whom we love. Now, this is something that happens not just exclusively for couples who are courting or couples who are married, but also for dear friends. And, you know, it's, it's not just a thing of chemistry, you know, men and women. It can happen with men and men, women and women, that you'll be thinking of somebody that you love and they call you. Or they're thinking of you and you call them. I don't know if it's happened to any of you, but, you know, they say, oh, I was just thinking of you. And you wonder what's going on. Well, what's going on, this is my explanation, I mean, there's a lot of supernatural explanations too, that uh, uh, I mean, a friend of mine from Rome just talked to me, he sent me an email this morning, so, you know, I was thinking that your name came to me in prayer this morning, you know, is everything okay? And so that there could be something of a spiritual thing going on there. But on a natural level as well, once we are receiving another person inside ourselves through sincere loving, and we're giving them ourselves through sincere loving, that knowledge of the other person begins to live in our memory. And our memory feeds our thinking. So then we find ourselves beginning gradually to think like that other person. And this happens particularly powerfully in spouses or deep relationships, intense relationships. So then it's not surprising that we're actually thinking, thank you, that we're actually thinking about the other person and then they're calling us. Because the, there's a symphony that's going on there between one person's thinking and another. Love also brings with it a certain affection. It's not just an action of the will. It is a decision, but it's an action of the will. So when we apply this then to God, we must love God through action. And also our love for God will have an accompaniment with it of, of affection, of, of tenderness, of emotion. Now, sometimes we'll feel dry in our prayers. Other times we'll feel more alive. But that's the natural progress of the relationship. And the more we commit ourselves to Christ, the more, of course, when we're praying and growing, then our love will grow. The more we sacrifice ourselves for Him, the more that love will grow within us. And then we begin to know, again, through faith and through hope, how He works in our lives. So we begin to see and sense His nearness to us, that He, in fact, does look after us, that even though He permits us to suffer, to go through difficulties and hardship, nevertheless, He is with us. So the love of God is something that is meant to be very much an action thing. It's inspired through a living faith, and a living faith always works through hope and through charity. If we never do many charitable things, whatever they happen to be, whatever form they take, the corporal or the spiritual works of mercy, then we can say at the very least that our love for God is actually lukewarm. And that should ring warning bells for us because it means we are actually susceptible to all sorts of winds of doctrine. Charity is gained obviously through grace from God, but it can be lost through grave sin. And then if we do lose charity, the love of God through grave sin, we would come back through hope. If we sin gravely against hope, then we would come back to hope and through to love, through the gift of faith. But if I sin gravely against faith, and I think it's actually more difficult to do than it seems, then God help me. Because faith, hope, and love are like a pyramid. One builds on the other. And we really, as we mature as human beings, and our defenses come down, and we get to know ourselves more fully, that's how we, in fact, become more and more holy and sanctified. And the union with God, our ultimate beloved, actually becomes more and more secure, even though it's ultimately only fulfilled in heaven. I'm going to stop there. Any quick questions before we go? Yes. Uh, just about, like, you know, 
uh, sort of natural heart and sort of natural heart, yes, yes. things like that, but also with love. Um, we can sort of be fulfilled so that um, how we know God through those things. Those who experience the natural, um, potentially the natural version of yes. those virtues, do they still learn about God? Through they those? learn about God, but they learn about God in a more theoretical way. The actual virtues of faith, hope, and love give us a taste of God in himself. And that's when, in the higher levels, as things begin to unfold and grow in holiness, the virtues, the gift of the Holy Spirit, begin to play more powerfully with us. So, for instance, the gift of wisdom works closely with the will and perfects it. It's the when the gift of wisdom is playing out very powerfully in our lives, it's the closest tasting of God that we can have on this earth. Because the gift of faith, for instance, does the devil have faith? Hmm. Well, in what sense? Now, the devil doesn't see God. The devil's in hell. But the devil sure knows that God is there. God exists. But does faith, does that kind of faith, because it's not a theological faith, the devil has no grace in his soul or even in his spirit, right? The things are completely dead there. So it's got to be a different kind of faith to our faith. Our faith actually enables us to recognize the presence of God, whereas the devil's faith isn't a theological faith. It's actually through the power of his intellect, which is enormous, and he deduces various things and knows that a greater power is at work. So I think we're going to have to go because we are, there's another class here. Thank you.